Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello, and welcome back to another edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Austin Davidson. It is our first episode back together in a really, really a while since uh, the early part of this pre-draft process, and we are just uh, just over a day away from the first round commencing, Austin, and uh, we'll get into some of the details going on with the Steelers and with the draft in general, but uh, just general thoughts as uh, we're getting ready to wrap this process up, what you thought about this year's prep and how you, how difficult it was to look at different players. Did that impact you differently? What did you think of the whole process? In terms of the draft, I felt like this is the most boring draft that we've looked at so far. Like, I felt like th- there wasn't a polarizing player. Like, every year I came out hating this set, set of players and loving this set of players. And I do have my few that I, like, really love, and I have, like, one or two that I hate. But, like, I felt kind of like a lot of people in this draft were just, like, meh. Like, I didn't really have many thoughts about them and I, I feel like even going into the first round like there's guys that we didn't look at and I just kind of been paying attention to that I'll maybe watch a little I've watched a little bit of tape of that I'm like bored of like the first round feels so so boring this year I, I don't know really what it is and then in terms of looking at prospects uh, it was tough I really 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 wanted to watch more on cornerbacks and, and safeties but the, there's such a lack of tape this year uh, for those kind of guys, I, I, for whatever reason, maybe the accounts that did it last year kind of got taken down, uh, as John was explaining to me earlier, that uh, they get t- copyrighted and deleted sometimes. So uh, I, it was tough. It was definitely tough for those positions. I really would have liked to do more late-round corners, but, like, there was no tape on early-round corners. Like, I, I looked at, like, the top, top of the draft, and, like, Caleb Farley had two games on YouTube. Like, that's... That's wild to me. That's Caleb Farley. That's a guy that's considered like a top fifteen pick by some. Fallen, but still. But yeah, it's been a tougher prospect uh, process this year. But uh, I hope next year there's there's more tape to watch. In general. Yeah, this whole process seems to be kind of odd this year with the opt outs, with the lack of tape being seen. I think there's a lot that has to be said for. The fact that the top of this draft seems to be really heavy offensive. I mean, when do you think the first defensive player could be taken? I think it could be as late as like 10 or 15 or 14. Yeah, it's looking like Sir 10 could be the first one off. And like that, we're looking at like maybe the Broncos at 9, maybe the the Cowboys at 10 are very popular for Sir 10. Uh, but I, I don't know. I feel like there's not many defensive players that are really top tier this year. Yeah, so it's it's definitely going to be strange, and I also feel like this is going to be a year, and I was saying this before, where we see more surprise picks in the first round, and really in general, than we've ever seen, where guys that, like, no one thought Terrell Edmonds was a first round pick, except for Pittsburgh, and that was kind of surprising. I think we could see a lot of that this year. It's definitely possible. Definitely possible with all the opt-outs, with COVID, with stuff like that. This could be different processes for teams this year so as we look ahead to your mock draft that you just did you did one at the start of this whole process as did i now you have a second final one here to talk about and i want to kind of walk through the whole process here uh, about how you did it you did it on the pff mock draft simulator which we are going to be doing ourselves uh and you've had you've had some work with this with this process And I just wanted to get your thoughts on what you were thinking going into this in terms of what you were looking for, speaking as the interim Steelers GM for this type of, for this process. I'll be real. Uh, This is more to my taste. So it's not maybe the most realistic in the sense that, first of all, I had a trade in mind, uh, a trade back, which in, in the first round, which for Kevin Colbert is not, something that happens very often if at all really then secondly i have i obviously hate running back so it's just i took that into account that i think that a first round running back is not a good idea and uh anything other than the first round i've kind of grown on i used to be anti second round as well but uh th- this year might have changed me a little bit but uh regardless so i went in knowing i need a center 
I need a cornerback and possibly two cornerbacks. I need edge depth really badly because Alex Highsmith and TJ Watt are, are it. Uh, I wanted to address uh, the offensive line a little bit more other than center. Uh, inside linebacker could use some help. Tight end, you definitely could use a number two or number three there. So I, I came in then. And then running back, you, you could add a running back at really any point. Uh, so that that was my thought process going into my mock draft. Okay. So your first the first action you took was actually not a pick. You traded down with the Atlanta Falcons. Can you talk about that trade a little bit? Yeah. So – Looking back, it's not the best value, but I was really I was obsessed with trading back. I re, I was I was going to do it regardless of what it cost me, and I, at first I really loved it, but now like looking back after I thought about it, it's kind of bad value. So, but I I was still happy. This is my favorite mock draft I did. I did a bunch of these prior. I, I was just kind of messing around to see what the trades were like, and I ended up saving this one because I liked it. But anyhow, I gave the Falcons twenty four, uh, and I gave them eighty seven. So I gave them our third round pick. Uh, so that's first and third. I received 35. So that means I moved back 11 spots going in, and I got pushed into the second round, the, the fourth pick of the second round. Or sorry, third pick of the second round. No, fourth. I was right originally. Uh, but uh, r- regardless, so I received 35, and then I also got 68. So now the, what, the idea was I traded up in the third round about 20 picks. So I traded up in the third round to get – from 87 to 68, then I got, I was, you know, there was something else I was really focusing on. I wanted a fifth round pick. I really, really, really wanted a fifth round pick this year. So I got 187 from them, so I got a fifth round pick. Then also I got a 2022 20, sixth round pick to move up for it. So I moved up, I moved back 11 spots in the first to move up about 20 spots in, in the third, and then I got a fifth, and then I got a next year's six. And I figured I, I, I'd, use that sixth next year to maybe get another fifth next year because I'm pretty sure the Steelers do not have a fifth next year because they traded it. But, uh, yeah, so that was a trade. Should I just go straight into the first prospect I took at 35? Well, yeah, so let's let's talk about that because this is a guy that's been projected as a mid to late first round guy. You get him early in the second, and it's a player that's been connected to Pittsburgh, and that's Asante Samuel Jr. Uh, I I'd be pretty happy with that because I think he's. I know that there there aren't reports saying that he is, but I think he could be in play at twenty four. I yeah, I think so for sure, and I was happy to see him there. I saw him, and I said I think that's the best player available at a position we need. Cornerback is now growing problem because now one, I I don't think I ever actually touched upon it on one of my. Uh, episodes is that Justin Lane got arrested and he's likely to face a suspension for his his arrest because it was stupid. So he admitted having a joint in the car, he got arrested for having an illegal gun and stuff like that. So uh, now with another cornerback likely down, I don't know what, if a suspension will come exactly. I don't, like it, they might just not give him a suspension, but like and I don't know if it'll even come this year. It might happen. It might take effect in uh, next season, but regardless, cornerback became more even more important to me after Steven Nelson's now gone and now Justin Lane just got himself arrested and could be suspended so we might need more corner death when we're already lacking. Going to the next pick though, uh, 55, Landon Dickerson was there and I could not say no to Landon Dickerson. I really really loved, loved his tape and I really felt like I talked about him and I said that if he was never injured he, we would be talking about him like Quentin Nelson which it's a big if to say if he was never injured, but we'd be talking about him like he was Quinn Nelson because he played better than everyone else on the field. Like he, his talent was immense. He, it was different from all the other centers that I looked at where he was, he was bullying people. He looked like the bigger man on the field. So I, I, I addressed center at 55. And uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, everything I'm seeing from people who are medical experts, if you will, seem to suggest that, they feel a little more comfortable with his injury history, but it's hard to ignore. Um, I could see Dickerson in play at 24. If Dickerson's at 24, I don't think that's a horrible pick. Oh, no. I I, I think Dickerson, yeah, Dickerson could be our, our first-round pick. It's been reported that way. So, so I, Dickerson, I like Dickerson in the second. Dickerson has the size and the ability. It's just that medical issue is something that you can't really scout. It's just a does he pass the medical or not. High risk, high reward, I suppose. Suppose because if, if he gets injured, it's just kind of going to be like over. If he keeps getting injured, it's just it's going to suck. 
and that's it's a little easier to stomach there than in the first round, which is good. But in the first two rounds, you've come away with two positions of need and two relatively uh, high thought of players in those first two picks. So I think that's a good outcome for two the first two rounds. In the third round, you address the defensive backfield again. Yeah, this time I went with Artarius Washington, the safety from TSU, T, not TSU, C, TCU, Texas Christian. I was thinking, I was looking at the best players on the board. I wasn't very happy. I was thinking about trading back, but I said, no, I traded up to this pick. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it. Uh, and I, I saw him. I figured he was the best player available. And what I was thinking was, we needed safety depth. I, I, so it would be a good pick for that. But I was thinking more of that he could be a nickel corner. Uh. I know that some people view him as possibly playing as a nickel corner, like the Mike Hilton kind of role. So I figured I was knocking out two birds with one stone where I really wanted to address the cornerbacks this year. And even though he's listed as a safety, and I think that in its own regard is kind of a luxury pick in that regard where p- picking a depth safety is really, really shouldn't have been happening in the third round. But I really just – I believe in his abilities as a slot corner uh, at the NFL level. I think he could transition to there. So – that's kind of what I took him with the idea being. Yeah, I actually saw him more easily profiled as a slot cornerback. I saw a lot of, I know it's easy because of the size, but guys like Tyron Matthew or Mike Hilton, I think he slides into that kind of that kind of role. I don't know that he's ever going to be as effective as those guys, but he's an adequate replacement, a hard-nosed type player, and I think that he's pretty solid. So that's another position that's not, it's not a bad thing to add because you can never have too many decent defensive backs as we've learned the last few years. And moving to your next pick, we had the first, uh, the, sorry, the second time you addressed the offensive line, this time you picked up a tackle in Brady Christensen. Yeah, from BYU. I, I thought that Christensen was a third rounder. So to me to see him in the fourth, I was very excited. Uh, the one thing that I knocked, I, I did rank him last for the Steelers in that episode uh, because of his short yardage woes, but he's a really good tackle other than not be getting much push in the short short yardage game. So I, I saw him there, and I could not say no. I, I was just I, – I think that's really good value, and PFF is – it's the one of the few A's a PFF gave me for taking him. So, Minus, I should say. So through your first – four picks, you have an even split between offensive linemen and defensive backs. As you're approaching the second half of your draft here, what is kind of your thought process at this point? Because you've gotten a couple more defensive backs, you've bolstered the offensive line. Are you thinking at this point now you want to look at running back? Are you thinking edge rusher? What's kind of your thought at this point? So what's funny is at 68, right, uh, at 55, I was looking at Javante Williams. I was thinking about it, and then I was like, mm, he might be there. I got all the – when I was at 68, I was slowing down the draft. I, I was looking like I was going to be able to get Javante Williams, so I was actually thinking of running back there, but he got taken, I think, at 65 in uh, in my mock. So uh, at, at that point, after Brady Christensen, I was like, well, the top tier – after our Darius Washington, I say, the top tier running backs are gone. I'm going to have to wait. So I actually put running running back on the back burner, and I was thinking more of addressing edge. And I was looking for a tight end, but tight end was so, so rough. I really wanted to be in earlier than a fifth-round tight end, but spoiler alert, I was not able to. So that was unfortunate. But I, I, did, I looked mostly towards the defense side of the ball to end the draft, honestly. All righty, and then your next pick is? Okay, so PFF kind of messed this up. My next pick was 140. I don't know. On the screen, it showed it that it happened afterward, but I traded 140. So I, I was just kind of looking. I was like, I wasn't in love with the board, and I looked at my trade offers. I said, mm, let me throw out a really messed up trade, like, <laughs> like a trade that shouldn't go through. So the Jaguars were interested in pick 140, and so I said, all right, have uh, take pick 140. I'll take one. Their next pick was 145. They're moving up one, uh, five spots. And you give me Minnesota's fourth round pick in next year, and the, uh, without even hesitating, they agreed. So I was, I was, I was, I, I had no idea what to think. I thought that this wasn't. I thought I was just going to be messing with trades, and that was literally my first trade. 
So I was very happy with that to move back five spots in the fourth round to get a next year's fourth round pick from Minnesota because they own it from the Yannick and Gokwe trade. Uh, I was extremely uh, happy with that. I, I And I still got who I was actually looking at at pick 145. So I guess I should just talk about that uh, first. I picked Jamin Davis, the linebacker from Kentucky. If you guys remember, I wasn't the biggest fan. I didn't like his value. I thought that he was more of uh, – people were considering him a third rounder. And at the time, that was ridiculous to me. Now, past that, people are saying, watch out for Jamin Davis. He might be a late first rounder to early second rounder. And that makes me want to throw out more. PFF didn't seem to echo that sentiment, and he fell into the fourth round where I was like, well, inside linebacker depth, that's good. I think that in the fourth round, that's not bad for Jamin Davis. And uh, he was my favorite player on the board there, so I, I elected to take Davis. So Davis is a guy that d didn't test super well in terms of speed, but he has size. Uh, what kind of role do you see him playing at the NFL level? Is he one of those moving linebackers, or is he kind of – he, or is he the thumper, or is he something in between? Kind of in between. Like, he didn't have amazing hit power when I looked at him, but uh, and he actually had some coverage abilities. Uh, other people think that he has, like, A-plus coverage abilities. I wouldn't say that, but I think he's somewhere in between where he's got enough speed, the speed is adequate, where he's going to be more of a coverage guy than a guy that's a thumper, but in between. All right. So after that trade, now at pick 187, you addressed edge rusher. Yes, one of my most re recent prospects. Uh, Chenarius Robinson was my favorite edge defender that I looked at. He has amazing length, and I think for a developmental guy in a weak edge edge class, I think that he'd be solid to be behind Alex Smith and TJ Watt. Uh, I think he could be an immediate uh, number three at, from the fifth round, and this is why I was grateful. This is the pick I got from the Falcons. So... Uh, I really, I think that was a good pick for for what what the board looked like there. As I recall, you were a fan of Javen Hawkins, or uh, yeah, Javian Hawkins from Louisville. It looks like you got him uh, with pick two sixteen, and that was a popular pick with the uh, with the mock draft simulator. What do you think about that? Javian Hawkins, I I literally said if it wasn't if I didn't look at Javante Williams, uh, Javian Hawkins would have been my favorite running back by far. He's the guy that's going to be the the fifth round, sixth round, seventh round pick. That's like, oh wow, where did this running back come from? Because there always is one, and I I think it's him. He's undersized. He really needs to bulk up. So it might take one season to you're going to be like, all right, this kid's a bust. But one season, Steelers running backs typically bulk up after their first rookie season. And then I feel like he's going to get good. I feel like that's that's all it's going to take. Because he played behind a really bad Louisville offensive line and made it work. I really liked what he showed. I liked what he showed as a pass catcher. Uh, adequate uh, adequate pass blocker and very willing blocker, though. Uh, not the best blocker in general, but he was willing to put his body in, into uh, into the violence and, and block. So uh, And especially for an undersized guy, I really like that. I think Javion Hawkins is a great pick, personally. I, I was, I was when I didn't get my top, the top tier running backs. I was looking for Javion Hawkins here later. Getting close to the end here, you addressed edge rusher again with Patrick Jones the second right from Pittsburgh. Uh, with the edge defenders at Pittsburgh, they have three guys that are in the draft this year. Jones was the guy you ended up with. I wasn't sure if Weaver was available or not. But Jones is a guy you got, and I, I'm curious if you think that he has an outside shot at this point. Uh, did you pick him just because he was an extra guy and you were running out of things to address on the board? You ended up with nine picks. Yeah, so I was looking at Edge, and I wasn't quite happy because I still didn't like behind Alex Highsmith and TJ Watt. Like I really felt like there's there's really nothing there other than now Janarius Robinson. So I double-dipped because I figured that Patrick Jones could still have a shot at making the roster. And Kurt, uh, not Curtis, Rashad Weaver was not uh, there. Rashad Weaver, I'm pretty sure, went in the third round. He oh, went wow. really, really high. Yeah. All right. Super high. And then your final pick, you bolstered the tight end room just a little bit. I know grabbing one this late was not something you had wanted, but you had just said that 
you didn't like the way the board was shaking out. Is tight end the one position that you came away, besides maybe edge rusher, you came away from this draft thinking maybe you could have done something differently to help out? I regret, yeah. I, I feel like I should I should have probably reached on – I probably should have switched out Artarius Washington and, to, and reached on uh, Brevin Jordan. I'm pretty sure he was still there because uh, Brevin Jordan was a guy that I liked a lot more. He was falling down draft boards. And I didn't really see why. I looked at him following people saying he was falling down trap boards because people were like, he can't block. And I'm like, yes, he can. <laughs> like, I, I watched his tape and he was, uh, I, I said it with my chest, he was a better blocker than Kyle Pitts. So, I mean, take that as you will. But, uh, that was a mistake. I, 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 sh- I just didn't think, I thought that he could have lasted, but then I, I didn't realize my next pick was 60 picks later where the tight ends would be wiped out because after 68, my next pick was at 128. So I literally went almost two rounds without the pick, basically. Uh, then, uh, But Kylan Granson was a guy that I was a fan of. He was second on my tight end board that I looked at for only behind Brevin Jordan. So... Uh, I think he's a good developmental pick. I'm not sure if he'd make the roster or not. I, I feel like he would because I think he's better than Zach Gentry just off rip, who's coming off injury. But uh, I, I really wish I addressed, it, addressed tight end earlier. That that was my one one thing I wasn't happy with coming out of this draft because people would probably complain about the running back situation, say J.B. Hawkins isn't the answer. But I... I, I really just don't I, – I didn't see the value in taking a running back just to take a running back. I feel like with the picks I made, I improved I improved the running game through adding the offensive linemen. I think that Brady Christensen would be a good swing tackle to start this year. I think that Landon Dickerson is going to be your starting center, and he's going to be really good at it, and he's going to make some, uh, make some big holes. So that should help. Favorite and least favorite pick real quick. Uh, my favorite pick, uh, probably Brady Christensen in the fourth round. I really liked that pick. I thought it was a good pick. And my least favorite pick was probably Kylan Grayson. I, I just, I, I didn't, re- I was thinking about even trading. I, I just thought it was kind of useless. I was thinking about trading it for a 2022-6, but uh, no one was interested in trading, so I did not. All right. Well, that was Austin's mock draft, uh, as we are just a day out from the NFL draft. So with that being the case, Uh, We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back talking a little bit about the Steelers ahead of their first round uh, selection, which will be coming just a little more than a day from now. And then we'll get into our own mock draft simulation. So we will be right back. All right, and we are back on the Stronger Than Steel podcast, John Keir and Austin Davidson. All right, so before we get into this mock draft simulation, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the Steelers ahead of the first round starting tomorrow. Uh, There have been several players' names listed in relation to the Steelers lately. We've seen a lot of Asante Samuel Jr., Landon Dickerson, Najee Harris, um, Tevin Jenkins a little bit of. We've also heard that Kyle Trask Uh, might be on on the Steelers' radar, and yeah, Zayvon Collins could be in play as well. Uh, We can leave Kyle Trask for another time. We can talk a little bit about him another time. Just for the first round pick between Collins, Dickerson, Harris, Jenkins, and uh, I think I already mentioned Dickerson. Um, Between those guys, which of those excites you the most? What do you think is uh, kind of going to be the most likely selection there? Uh, Excites me the most would be Jenkins. I think that Jenkins is probably the best pick there for value. I think Dickerson might be there at 55. And then the least exciting is going to be Najee Harris. Obviously, I didn't uh, rank Najee Harris very well with my other running backs. I didn't even consider him the best running back in this class. So uh, I personally wouldn't like Najee Harris there. But unfortunately, again, we as Steelers fans, if you, if you don't want Najee Harris, you're probably going to have to prepare yourself like we have because Najee Harris is almost 80% chance of being the pick, I feel like, at this point. So, assuming Harris ends up being the pick, what what is our kind of thought process there for what this is? Because we already know how we feel about it. We don't like it. Uh, I don't think we need to spend a ton of time talking about why we don't. Uh, we we've done plenty of that. And for anyone that anyone that wants to know about why running backs are considered less helpful than other positions, just look watch look at anything regarding Pro Football Focus. And I know that people don't love numbers in terms of like only analytics, but 
running backs just really don't move the needle. So I won't get into it a ton right now, but I think that that's just the simple fact of the matter is they don't move the needle. And I guess for the Steelers, if that's what happens, we're talking about Harris after day one. What have we really improved? Uh, not much, but I'm I'm going to take it. I'm going to hope for the best. I'm going to hope that he's a top 10 running back of all time and that I was wrong. So that's what I'm going to hope for because, you know what, if you get a top 10 running back of all time with a first-round pick, I, I, I think it's worth it. But uh, that's honestly a long shot. But that's what I'm going to hope for. I'm going to pretend that he's he is going to be a top 10 running back if the Steelers select him. And that's what I'm going to live off of. How would you feel about Zayvon Collins at 24? I think that's a little bit of a reach. I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of Saban Collins. I just think that I, – I don't think that inside linebacker is even that much of a need anymore anyway. I mean, you could still use some faster guys an inside linebacker if you wanted, but you have, like, a good amount of inside linebacker depth. Honestly, edge, if, edge seems more important address but even then it's just like those are positions where you have your starters you have Alex Heisman you have TJ Watt at inside linebacker you have Devin Bush and Vince Williams and you brought back um why can't I think of his name Spillane yeah we brought back Spillane uh so you have your starters and again you're lacking speed at inside linebacker so I guess you could argue that but just you you still have your guys there I, I don't know I feel like there's tons of other positions that need help more I wasn't a huge fan of Zayvon Collins. I liked him, but I thought 24 might be a bit rich. What's weird about him is he is a really good athlete, but he, I don't know if you saw, he weighed in at the pro day at like 270 pounds. I mean, that's closer to a defensive tackle today than it is a linebacker. Yeah, that's pretty hefty. I mean, Dar- Darius Leonard was talking about how he plays like sometimes sub 210. Like that's almost like a safety weight. So if you're having Collins playing that that weight, he's looking more like a LeVon Kirkland than he is a Devin Bush. And I know that he's a lot taller. That's kind of interesting. I don't mind the idea of fortifying a strength in terms of that position, making the rich richer in that instance. But I just think there's a lot of holes that need to be addressed first. Would you be surprised if Collins was the pick, though? I would. I think that Collins in the first round doesn't make sense only because – uh, the Steelers didn't attend his pro day. I I should say Kevin Colbert and Mike Tomlin didn't attend his pro day. They were Steelers scouts at, at Tulsa. But uh, additionally, the Steelers, to make a first-round pick, Kevin Colbert and Mike Tomlin have, have to be there. And that's going to uh, – they have to be at a guy's pro day for them to make that first-round pick. And they were not at Stephen Collins. Which, if they were at Tulsa's pro day, that's a big deal because Tulsa is obviously a very small school. So – Comparatively, like compared to like a school like Alabama, uh, they did not go there, so it is highly unlikely. But there's always a chance for mold to be broken in a very weird year. Who knows? I, I just I doubt it. I doubt the mold will be broken. You do bring up a good point. The last ten drafts, at least, the Colbert Tomlin attending the pro day has been the case. All right, so let's move into into the mock draft simulator here. I'm going to get started here. Uh, First things first, let's speed this up a little bit. Trevor Lawrence has gone first. Zach Wilson second. And as the board is starting to unfold here, we got three quarterbacks off the board first. And uh, as, as this draft kind of unfolds here, I wanted to talk to you a little bit, Austin, about uh, just kind of what you think – I know we talked a little bit about this beforehand, but do you really think that we could have five quarterbacks going in the first round, in the first maybe even ten picks? That's definitely possible. I mean, uh, the 49ers are confusing as all heck. Apparently, they are in on either Mac Jones or Trey Lance at number three. And then I think if Fields falls, that uh, the number four pick is going to be highly sought after because I think teams really like should like Fields. I don't know. I didn't really watch Fields' tape. Uh, I think that's going to become important. And then you also have uh, Mac Jones. Uh, or somewhat, either Trey Lance or Mac Jones is going to fall if the 49ers do end up or they're going to end up taking one. So I think it's very possible that five go in the first round. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll speed up the process through the rest of the draft, but as I wanted to watch the board unfold to start here, all right, so we are up at pick 24, 
and uh, I'll list some of the best available players according to PFF. Uh, the top-rated guy right now is Rashad Bateman. I don't think we need a receiver. We have four. First things first, we have four teams that are willing to offer a trade with us. Uh, we have the Atlanta Falcons, the Carolina Panthers, Detroit Lions, and Indianapolis Colts uh, looking to offer trades. The Falcons have picked 35, and I know you just made a trade with them in your last mock. Do you want to try to make a trade with them? I'm I'm okay with making trades, but we can only – my deal is we make one trade down and one trade up. That's the most we can do. We could try with the Falcons. Try uh, to move back to – that's the highest one, right? 35? Yes. The other picks yeah, would yeah. be 39, 41, and 54. So 35? Yeah, I think 35 is pretty cool. I think that's a good spot to draft someone. Okay. So we'll give them 24 for 35. What else do we want from them? I feel like we hmm. – so they don't have a second, right, if I remember correctly? They traded it for their next, Hurst. Their next pick is 68. Yeah. Hmm. We could try 68, and then we could give them maybe a seventh and see if they accept it. <laughs> yeah, I'm down for that. I think just getting – getting the third round pick and moving out of the seventh when we have two sevens that's not a bad trade uh i'm going to give them pick number 254 which is the last pick we have all right looks like the trade was rejected so i guess we could try with the earlier seven and then see about it see if that that pushes the needle to move up i think like 10 picks we'll do 245 it was accepted. Oh, they are like, nah, we, we know you have a better seventh. Get out of here. <laughs> All right, well, that's cool. I, I respect that, picking up an extra third. All right. So now we are moving down the board. I see Najee Harris has gone. Zayvon Collins has just gone. Kadarius Toney. So as we get to pick 35 here, this will be a second-round pick, so there's no fifth-year option on this player. So that that is something to keep in mind. Jets are picking at 34. Here we are at 35. Top-ranked player is Elijah Moore. Uh, we still have Asante Samuel Jr., Tevin Jenkins among the top two guys there. Landon Dickerson also still on the board. Uh, looks like Travis Etienne is gone as well. Uh, Javante Williams is the only remaining top back. So pick 35, I would say Samuel Jr., Jenkins, and Williams are probably the three guys we're looking in on. In fact, I'm going to see if I can share my screen so you can see what I'm looking at. I just did Samuel Jr., so I'm leaning towards Tevin. I think uh, Jenkins would be a solid pick there mm -hmm. just to change it up. So I'm leaning towards Tevin off rip just to change it up a little bit but you know okay I'm down for well why don't we take a take him then we'll draft tevin jenkins down for whatever and that is what we did can you uh see by the way i can see okay all right so our next pick is at 55 yeah so with yeah. jenkins coming in he's going to be the swing tackle uh, do you think that it's possible he could end up starting over a guy like Chakwoma or Korafor? It's definitely possible. Korafor isn't, like, safe in any regard. I mean, he was technically the backup last year and just got to start. Oh, there goes Asante Samuel to the Cowboys. It's a good pick. They, 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 I wonder if they went Sertan and then Asante Samuel. Let's uh, see. But... They took Jalen Waddle. Oh, really? Oh, that's... That's yeah, making the rich. If if <laughs> if adding Zayvon Collins would have been making the rich richer, then that's even worse. Kyle Trash to yeah. the Bears. I could see that happening. That makes sense. All right, so here we are now. Lander Dickerson's there for pick number two. You want to just go right with that? I mean, you see the board. We've got Jamin Davis, Elijah Molden. A lot of defensive backs here. Javante yeah, Williams is on the board too. Do we want to do Javante? Ooh, it's kind of tough. Uh, we could. We can't trade back now. That's the thing. We can only trade up. 
If we want, we could try to take Javante, and then we could try to trade up for a guy like Quinn Miners. So when's our next pick? We're at 55. Our next pick 68. is 68. So do you want to try to get to like 62, 63? And then I'll pause it. Yeah. Or we could also take Dickerson and then try to trade up. Uh, I think we're going to try to trade up in this next round, but it's going to be who do we take and who do we try to trade up for? I say we go... Go Javante. I agree there's because centers, there's two centers. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so it makes sense to go Javante here and then try and see who's going to be there. If Quinn Miners is going to be there or Landon Dickerson. All right. If I see a center coming off the board, I will pause it right away. Okay. All right. So Javante Williams is the pick. So far, no centers coming off the board. We're 10 picks away. Peyton Turner, Saints up at 60. Creed Humphrey, that's not a name I had thought about. Uh, yeah, he wasn't even on the center board. I forgot because PFF doesn't like oh, him. There goes Miners. Okay, so I paused it. We're pick 63. We would need to move up five picks here. So I'm assuming we want to try to trade up for Dickerson. Yeah, I think that it makes sense. I mean, we're going to have to hope that they're not too expensive. The Chiefs also need offensive linemen, so they could very well be planning to take Dickerson right here. So, All right. So the first thing we do is we get those two picks out there. Um, in order to get this pick, I'm thinking we sh we're going to have to give up possibly a four. I don't know that I want to give up this year's four, though. I was literally thinking 2022-4 because we're going to have a comp pick third going into next year. So I think for five picks, that's not bad. Five picks this high. I mean, the Jaguars did the same thing in my mock draft, but they did it in round four. We're going from round three into the end of round two. So uh, we'll see if that works. All right. You want to see if we can get our own 207 back? Oh, sure. Yeah. All Why right. do they have 207? I don't know. Let's try it, though. I literally don't remember. Trade was accepted. Oh, nice. Okay, All right. so we get back. So we get Dickerson right here? Yeah. All right, very nice. good. And according to the board, we got him at a good value. So, at this point, we've gotten Tevin Jenkins, Javante Williams, and now Landon Dickerson. So that pick that we, we traded... To fixing the running game. Yeah. So that... That trade with the Falcons we made right away. We took that pick, one of those picks we got from them, and immediately flipped it. I respect that. Nice. It worked out nice. No more trading for this draft, though. Everything yep. else is... Yep. We're static trading. now. And that's fine. I think it can be easy to get suckered into picking or trading a lot in this year's draft mm -hmm. with these simulators. I mean, they're really nicely done. So, I think... I think they did a really good job, and it's easy to want to see all these offers and make trades. So we have definitely upgraded. We've gotten two linemen and a running back. But now we have our issues with depth everywhere else. And as you see the way the board is unfolding here, are you more on the best player available at this point? I think from here we could kind of move on to like best player available for the most part. I mean, I'd still avoid wide receiver, but... Uh... I think we could, if there's any of a position that we really like, I think we could take it. So we've got Tay so, Gowan, Calvin Joseph, and Jamin Davis uh, here at pick 87. I think we should go a cornerback here, personally. All right. so, I, think, I think. Let's see what. I don't what, know much about Calvin Joseph at all. Joseph possesses tools that could go in the top 10 with more seasoning. There's little of that in the, his game at this point, though. Past suspension, rumored off-the-field issues. Doesn't sound like a Steelers player to me, unless if you're Justin Lane. Yeah. Um, Second best game is against Alabama, though. That That's is bad. interesting, yes. And then Tay Gowan from UCF. Let's see what they have to say about him. Do we go off the board, though? Do we think about a guy like Jamar Johnson? The safety from Indiana? Could. I mean, we need safety depth. 
limited snaps, but he shows he has coverage skills. He missed 80 tackle or 18 uh, misses on 80 career attempts, only 769 snaps. Mm, yeah, he played pretty average against most teams. That looks good. Looks like he tested well, was playing all over the field here, and is 6'1", so he has size. Do we want to look at safety then? Uh, can we look at the tight end board real quick? Yeah, sure. For some for some reason, I can't get Tay Gowan to open up right here. Let's see who's Tommy Tremble and Hunter Long and Brevin Jordan. Oh, Brevin Jordan is there. Oh, they wait, have him ranked really low that? here. We could try to take him with our next pick, but and, he also uh, might be actually, gone by then. I forgot we. I forgot this is our second third round pick. I was like, I was like, I, I'm figuring we're in the fourth round. Okay. I think we can wait on tight end with that being said. So that was good to figure out. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I think... I can't get Tay Gowan to open up right here. I'd love to see what it says about him. But between the two... Between Jamar Johnson, the safety from Indiana, and Kelvin Joseph, uh, which guy are you more leaning towards right now? I'd be about the safety. I would agree. The off-field issues are a concern to me. What I'm seeing about yeah. Tay Gowan is that he only has one season of college football under his belt back in 2019 before uh, opting out. Was he an opt-out in 2020? That is correct, so I would lean away from that. Okay. So Jamar Johnson uh, it is? Jamar Johnson it is. All right. Jamar. Jamar Johnson is the pick at number 87. So our first defensive player off the board in the top 100. And now we have... 40 picks till our next selection. But we've upgraded the offensive line. We've upgraded the running game. And now we've added some safety depth. I like the way this is unfolding right now. That's not bad. Not bad. We have five picks remaining at this point. I see Kenneth Gainwell just went off the board there. There we go. What is uh, one? Jordan just left. Oh, uh, Hunter Long, too. And uh, I think I see Tommy Tremble. Oh. Uh, I think all the, the no, I saw it to guy. Tommy okay. Toe guy. Tommy, yeah, okay. I I saw Tommy and it was like all the tight ends just kind of eat. Oh, here's our pick. Tommy Trumbull is available. Uh, I feel like Tommy Trumbull would be a good pick here. I said that he has fourth round value, and I mean, look at the tight end board after that. Like, picked up Kylan Grant in the seventh round, and he's now like the the third best tight end remaining. I feel like if we want to address tight end, we got to do it now. So you talk to me. Is he really a tight end or is he more of an H-back? Uh, he is... I think he's more of a tight end. Like, he actually did play uh, snaps up there, but he, he was versatile. He, he he really... He played out of the... He was an H-back, too, and he played fullback. But, like, he does actually have some hands. He okay. split out wide. As I'm scrolling through here, do you see any names that uh, tickle your fancy here? Not like Tommy? Not really. I mean, I'm surprised Brady Christensen is still there, but I think that's where I got him last time, too. I got him at 128. Stone Forsyth is interesting, but we already got a tackle. And so the tackles there, the tackle depth in this class is so nice because Forsyth and Christensen are there. I think, like, because if you go to the tight end room, right, like, uh, Look at the tight ends that are left. There are not, not a lot of tight ends left. No. And what's interesting is he's most drafted in these simulations by Pittsburgh. Yeah, 11% of the time. Interesting. All right. Yeah. So we will take Tommy Tremble then. We are committed to fixing the run game. Continued. We have definitely tried. Careful. And on top of that, I've heard this said a lot. It's also about building the nest for the next quarterback that comes in next year. You want to make things easier for him. And as we get another pick here real quickly, um, we still got a decent amount of top 100 players on the board here. So as a reminder, we've gotten – who have we gotten? We took Tevin Jenkins. We took uh, Javante Williams, Javante. Landon Dickerson, and now uh, Tommy Tremble. So – I think uh, I think edge rusher and inside linebacker and cornerback are positions where we're probably looking. Yeah. Trying to see 
more about these guys. I mean, Brady Christensen's still on the board. That's a lot of investment in the offensive line, though. Yeah, that is. I feel like we've already done a good amount there. We have a six foot three, two 205 pound cornerback in Benjamin St. Just. Just a. Just a. Trey yeah, Brown. Uh, what do you think about Milne? I, I liked what I saw from him. I think he's a little more risk than reward, but he's he doesn't he also doesn't have a super high upside, but I think it's a decent upside as a slot receiver. Yeah, that's fair. I just don't know. The, te- the team loves drafting a wide receiver every year. So, I mean, it might be possible. But do we so want to? Been, do we, we want to? I really don't want to. <laughs> All right, do we want to take a chance on Jamin Davis at this point? I think that Jamin Davis here is a solid pick. I think that it's a solid inside linebacker depth. All right. Into, yeah. I like it. Let's do oh, it then. Davis. So there's Jamin Davis. And we have a long wait now for our next pick, which is number 207. Jared Patterson just what? I had a question. Do you think that it's possible at all the Steelers could double dip at a position like running back, even if they take a guy like Javante Williams early, and how would you feel about that? Sure hope they don't, but, uh, yeah, it's definitely possible. I was thinking that, about that because all their running backs are replaceable. They all have – we have three tier three running backs. And, I mean, maybe Jalen Samuels is tier four. So, I mean, like, I think it's totally possible that uh, we end up uh, double dipping at, at – I just really hope we don't. I would agree with you. So as we approach our last three picks here, position becomes less important, as does potential, and can they contribute on special teams generally. As we are coming up on pick number 200, are you happy with the way things have unfolded here? And now we're just looking for depth. Um, Overall, you feel good about the way things are going? I think so. I mean... I have a really funny feeling that the Steelers are going to come out of this draft without a cornerback. So uh, I, I think that this is going about as as I'd expect. So I think that's uh, – I'm sorry, let's look at the board. I, I, I think that's pretty – that's fine in that regard. You know what I want? Can you go to the cornerback for a second, though? Yeah. Let's see. There's a guy that's rejected as a later-round guy that I really like. I don't know if he's still there. It doesn't look like it. Zach McPherson is, is a popular pick for people. I don't know anything about him, though. I kept seeing his name, Texas Tech. He's, his stock appears to be rising. There's no yeah, summary that's... on him, so there isn't much that's been written about him yet. Let's see, he's a versatile corner, can get physical, at least profiles well to special teams. He profiles well to special teams? That might be an interesting pick. No special physical tools. Uh, he was mostly outside, not much in the slot. Okay. Okay. So, do we want to take a chance? He's a projected sixth rounder, so that's right around where we are. What about Bryce Thompson? Let me check out Bryce Thompson. Don't know much about him. He's a smaller cornerback. Now, here's a guy. Here's a guy. Played best against Kentucky and Vanderbilt. Absolutely destroyed Vanderbilt, but who didn't? Because Vanderbilt was terrible this year. Not much being talked about with him, but he's only given up two touchdowns the last uh, two seasons. Pretty good. It's 80 grade. 80 grade is pretty high. Do we want to take Thompson, who is a smaller guy, but maybe a higher upside from what I can tell as opposed to a guy that looks like a special teams player? I'm not opposed to a special teams guy. Um I don't know. You're not going to find guys that are going to come in and contribute right away this late. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards Bryce because McPherson isn't even, like, he doesn't have the physical tools, so that makes me question his special teams right. ability. So I would lean towards Bryce, which unfortunately is a guy we didn't weren't able to look at because Tape. the cornerback, it was terrible. All right, Bryce Thompson will be our selection. All right, we have one more pick Slow, uh, quickly here, and then we'll have one final selection later on. All right. Let's see where we're at now. Uh, There's edge rushers. 
We've got another center, another tight end. Who's Chauncey Golston? Early down Rudden defender, Five. not an impact pass rusher. He looks like more 6'5", 270 is pretty good size. That's not bad. No explosive element to his game, so he's going to be like Anthony Ciccolo. Oh, yeah. Made best against Wisconsin. Interesting. So that's one option right there. He's a projected fifth rounder. Uh, let's look at Briley Moore from Kansas State. Tight end, not much being talked about here. Uh, in fact, there's practically nothing here about him. He's 6'4", 250, so he's pretty undersized. Only relatively lackluster production for him. Uh, that seems like a even worse than a Zach Gentry type of pick to me. Yeah. Do we want to add a third offensive lineman in this draft? Outside zone fit center. That doesn't apply to Pittsburgh, so that doesn't seem like a good fit to me. Is there anyone else here you're thinking about? There's no one that's really, like... Is this where we take our receiver? I mean, we could totally take a receiver here if we like one. Antonio Nunn from Buffalo. Solid all-round receiver. Doesn't have much on tape that excites. Yeah, average size, no special trait, poor competition, which doesn't bother me because Deontay Johnson came from Toledo, which plays in the same yeah. conference as Buffalo. Uh, 30 for 71 on contested targets, which is a bit of an issue if he's not going to be separating much. Um, unquestioned number one target the last two years. He's accounted for over 40% of Buffalo's receiving yards. So if it wasn't Jarrett Patterson, it was this guy. Mostly wide, probably projects to a slot. Interesting. I like either him or, wait a minute, here's Jonathan Adams Jr., another receiver from Arkansas State. Limited route tree. Turning radius of a semi-truck. <laughs> Classic. Speed downfield doesn't match the burst. Relies a lot on physicality. He had 12 touchdowns last season. Stiff lower half, highlight real grab. So he's basically the polar opposite of Antonio Nunn. So we've got a couple options there, and we've got Chauncey Goldston, I'd say, are our top three selections here. What do you think about the two yeah. receivers? Where would you lean more towards? I would lean towards Jonathan Adams Jr. I think a limited route tree can be coached up. I feel like uh, you teach them to get crisp out of their breaks. I mean, it's kind of hard sometimes to teach a little bit of flexibility, but I would lean towards him personally because he's got the spectacular catches and grabs that he can make, and I, I, I – it's always exciting to me for a six-round developmental pick or seventh-round developmental pick. What I'm seeing on this is basically he is a bigger version of a poor man's James Washington. Yeah. All right, and then as far as the edge rusher Goldston, do we want to think about, even though he's unspectacular, he should be a good special teams player, might be okay as a number three or four? Yeah, I mean, it would be for depth so it wouldn't be the worst pick in the world, and it would actually give you depth in a position of need. Maybe that's the move. Maybe. Do you have an, an opinion one way or another? Um, not really. Uh, I, I feel like if I was asked, I would probably do Chauncey just because of, of the need and having some depth there and give him a chance to compete. I don't really mind because this is a developmental pick regardless. Like, it's a guy that's not going to be seeing much playing time immediately, and that's a good thing. That's okay. Like, that's not bad. So I wouldn't wouldn't be mad if we did not get Chauncey. I wish we knew – I don't have it on me – which free agents are available because I'd almost just want to take – see if there's something on the scrap heap if you can't get him. Because I'd be leading, leading Adams. Do you want to flip a coin? <laughs> uh, we could do Adams. Uh, I'm cool with that. Okay. So we'll take Adams this time because that seems very Steelers to make sure they come away with a receiver even though they don't really need one this year. And now we have, we have one more pick at pick 254, so that's an, uh, relatively deep in the seventh round. 
Wap Fialor. Now, these are a lot of names that you try to look for guys like this, you're not going to find them. Well, I really want, I looked him up. I, wa- I wanted to look at him because that was a heck of a name. There's Javian Hawkins going in round seven. Bye-bye, Javian Hawkins. Who did he go to, Eagles? He went to Denver. I went to Denver. Oh, that's a good fit. He can play behind Melvin Gordon. All right. Here's our last pick. We are at 254 uh, with just six picks remaining. And this is how the board is standing right now. Uh, We've got some safeties. We've got an edge rusher. Matt Bushman's available. Yeah, Matt Bushman might be – is interesting. I feel like uh, behind Tommy Tremble – Here's Tony Poligian, or Poljan, six foot seven, two sixty five. I didn't look at him. I don't know if you did. No, I did not. It says throwback tight end, classic number two, which is interesting. Bushman, you can tell me more about. You can tell everyone more about. Yeah, Matt Bushman was projected to be a really high tight end pick, and I gave him a fourth round grade, so he'd be a really high pick. I mean, I mean, it'd be a high value in my opinion because. The reason why he fell down draft boards is he tore his ACL before the 2020 season, like right before in the preseason. So, but I mean, you, he was the number. He was BYU's leading target for two, two, three years, three years before this season. Like he was, he was a tight end, and he led them in receiving yards despite them having Dax Milne uh, for a little bit. So he was a really good receiving option in in that regard. And then I thought his blocking it, it could use some work, but it was adequate. But I give him a fourth round grade because I felt like the injury it was it, the injury was the only thing that was like knocking him really like that was really bad. Oh, the other thing is he's old. He's gonna be twenty five by the mid of the season. So he's older, uh, so the shelf life won't last as long. But uh, Bushman's a uh, would be a solid pick here, and I feel like he could beat out uh, Gentry for number three. You seeing anything else here that interests you as we roll down this page? <laughs> All right, so I think it's down to these three guys. Raymond Johnson the third, who's an edge rusher out of Georgia Southern. Reading his uh, his profile here, he has power and hand usage to make an NFL roster. Aggressive hands and 270 pounds, six foot three. Saw improvement every year, but he's a stiff pass rusher. He can't separate from tackles. Doesn't win much on the edge. It's all inside, which is going to make him limited. So. There's a limited player there with some upside. We talked about Bushman and Tony Poljan from Virginia. Almost a glorified tackle at his size. Think of Trayvon Wesco. Great for inline blocking, large wingspan, not dynamic in the slightest, it says. Ball security issues. No drive in his feet as a line uh, run blocker. So his athleticism is really lacking. Former quarterback. Really a throwback tight end, kind of like a Mark Bruner style. So, between those three guys, what do you think about all that? Um, I like the edge rusher. I think that the uh, the Steelers are going are to come away with one edge rusher, and, and so I like him because, I mean, he also graded really well in PFF. I mean, he did really well in that regard. I feel like the seventh-round pick, that's not bad. I think that the depth behind... I Smith and Watt is very, very much lacking, and we already got Tommy Tremble, so we could roll with Eric Ebron, Tommy Tremble, and Zach Gentry, even if I don't like Zach Gentry. I'm cool with that, personally, but I'm down for whatever. Again, this, uh, honestly, it's seventh round pick. It's more, it's not about what you're going to get. Uh, who's, it's not, a, you're basically taking developmental guys, guys that you think that with some time might turn into something good. And I, I think that for any position here. It, 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 the position doesn't honestly matter. I'm okay with taking pick number 254 on the highest graded edge defender in college football last season. Yeah. All right. I think, I think that's a good risk. All right. A risk, high reward. So there we go. And who knows, maybe one of those tight ends is on the board afterwards. So, yeah, in fact, it looks like none of those guys was available or was taken. So maybe you can get them as a UDFA. All right. So we got overall a B for that, and the trade was a B minus. 
Tevin Jenkins and Javante Williams were high-graded picks. Our second trade was only a C. They didn't like us taking Landon Dickerson that late for some reason. Jamar Johnson was a C plus. Tommy Tremble was an A minus. Nice, so not bad. Th- three A's, that's pretty good. Jamin Davis. We got a lot of C pluses to end. Four straight C pluses to end, and then two other C pluses. So our trades netted a C plus, and we had three A minuses, a C, and four C pluses. That's kind of interesting. It's not bad. We did okay. We did okay there. All right. Rating is interesting. Yeah, I I feel like they they will never give you a an A or like a D for a draft. I saw someone the way to get an A is if you draft all quarterbacks, quarterbacks. you get an A. Yep. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. And if you draft all running backs, you get an F. <laughs> That's lit. I I get okay. that though. Okay. So, with that being said, any final thoughts here before we prepare for uh, the draft starting tomorrow? Uh, no. Alrighty. Well, Austin, I appreciate your hard work during this process, and uh, we'll be back uh, after the draft to talk a little bit. Maybe not necessarily day one. Maybe we'll do a little bit. Probably not, but I imagine we'll have a lot to say after the draft is over this weekend. So we'll probably reconvene at that point and discuss the draft in general and what we thought about the Steelers' picks. Uh, Sound good? Sounds good to me. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you as always for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Uh, If you have any questions about the show, please feel free to email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com. We hope you enjoy the draft this weekend, and uh, stay safe out there and have a terrific time. Uh, Austin, thanks for joining me, and uh, until next time, thank you for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with Austin and John. Bye. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.